nobody accused me of being smart. Well, thank you everybody for having me. It's an honor to be here uh, to uh, speak at NOLCON. Um, that's a, a very warm welcome, a little too generous. Uh, I often say um, uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Uh, most of the uh, amazing things that come out of the company are done by the team, obviously. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have a, a merry band of pirates that are uh, very, very smart, as you can probably see by our research. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, hardware. Um, I think we all know that you know, uh, the software world, we've, we've made great strides in helping secure the software layer. Uh, which uh, brings us to kind of the next uh, the area where attacks, you know, as a, the uh, the threshold of effort uh, increases, uh, it's trying to get remote footholds within the software layer. People start looking lower and lower in the stack to uh, identify new areas of weakness. So, just a quick uh, show of hands: How many here in the room have um, looked at a, like a lab, seen a fib or a sim, uh, done any fib edits? Got one person. Uh, how many people here in the software industry, software security industry? Okay, great. So we'll uh, we'll couch the presentation from a software uh, engineer's uh, point of view into the hardware world, which is great because uh, uh, you can't divorce one from the other. Software relies on hardware. Hardware relies on software. Okay, so moving on. So this is a, a, a boy band that I used to be in. Actually, this is my hacking group uh, that we started in Seattle. Uh, this is a crew of people who went down to DEF CON and uh, won Capture the Flag for three years in a row, as previously mentioned. Um, and, uh, and then Jeff Moss asked us to retire to allow other people to win because it was getting, getting a bit boring seeing the same team show up year over year and win the contest. So, uh, so we kind of all sat around after uh, we were asked to move on and looked at each other and thought, well, what are we going to do now? And so we decided to uh, design the game. So when we were playing the game, uh, it was uh, the score was kept on literally paper and markers on the wall. So it'd be like team red, green, blue. And if you scored a, a point against team red, uh, Miles would go over to the, the uh, butcher paper and put one point for team X. And so we thought we could improve that. And so what you see today when you go to DEF CON, the, the video, uh, the overheads, the automated scoreboards, uh, the servers, et cetera, we, uh, we actually designed the initial uh, version of that. Uh, so that's kind of a bit of our legacy you can see hanging on the walls. But they've taken it so much farther than uh, where, where we left it. So it's really cool to see. Uh, I got my start in the industry just because I'm passionate about security. I would be doing this whether I got paid to do it or not. Uh, most, uh, just like a lot of people that work in the company, the reason that we release interesting research is because this is what our guys do. They go home or uh, on the weekends, uh, they're looking at hoverboards, they're poking at robots, they're looking at new IoT devices to see how, uh, how they can establish any kind of like footholds within that ecosystem and, uh, and publish research. And... Uh, so, um, yeah, moving on. So I founded IOActive in 1998. Uh, that was before electricity. Um, it's grown into a global consultancy. Uh, obviously, our kind of a research first style organization. Um, and the idea is that just like Ralph Nader, you probably haven't heard of him. He's kind of a U.S. guy. His idea was to uh, make sure that, um, you know, companies uh, exist, but when they're releasing products into the world, that they're doing so in a, in a kind of... Uh, uh, responsible manner. So we, we kind of look at ourselves in a, in a way uh, helping you know, that thin blue blue line of uh, helping the uh, community stay protected uh, from some of these unneeded, unnecessary threats that you probably have seen uh, in the digital space. Um, but saying that, there's too much work. As you can see, that technology is increasing uh, more and more rapidly. Moore's law is almost there needs to be a new law. There's not one day I wake up that I don't see technology that's occupied a new space in our life, and that's going to take uh, millions and millions and millions of security practitioners uh, working day and night to ensure that that uh, security posture of those products and services are actually secure. Because as you know, time to market often limits the security voice at the table. The products are released. Uh, security is an afterthought, and then we have to read about it on, uh, on bug track, uh, et cetera. So the more you guys get involved and excited about this industry, the better off my niece and my nephew will be. Okay, here's our uh, history of our research. Um, I'm not quite sure how we come about the things that we go on to. I think it's just curiosity that really leads uh, our, our, our research body. Uh, so you might have seen the, the GPAC that came out uh, last year. 
Um, that was basically uh, the first remote, purely remote uh, uh, takeover of a vehicle uh, through its comm systems and cellular link. And that, that was basically kind of a quick case in point where you can understand that just connecting uh, devices to the internet or cellular networks, et cetera, uh, as a feature or cool like uh, call home or uh, get your new Google uh, updates, et cetera, might not be such a great idea without doing the appropriate threat models, uh, pen testing, fuzz testing, et cetera, on the, on the product line. Uh, the, that car was actually taken over completely. The CAN bus was compromised, and the car was driven off the freeway into a ditch uh, at low speed, thankfully, but uh, who knows what that wired reporter was thinking to agree to that demo. I wouldn't have done it. He had a semi truck coming behind him when the car drove off the road. So he must not have had a, yeah, I don't know, thrill seeker. And then you might have seen, uh, we also, Barnaby Jack, uh, uh, bless him, uh, we did some research on ATMs. Everybody kind of looked at ATMs and were like, well, do those things really, are they really that secure? It's kind of a house of cards. Well, Barnaby was uh, uh, inspired by the Terminator movie where the kid goes up to the ATM and and hacks it and gets cash out. And who doesn't like an ATM that's spitting out cash? So Barnes took it upon himself to uh, go ahead and uh, reverse engineer a couple different ATMs and, and uh, see what he could do. But some of the best stories were him uh, ordering those ATMs to his apartment and, uh, and having to discuss with the, uh, the service engineer about how that was, why he was actually having ATMs shipped to his apartment in San Jose. And he would tell the, uh, He'd tell the, the service engineer who had to take the ATMs up three flights of stairs, and they're quite heavy, uh, that he's like, well, mate, it just saves me another trip around the corner to get cash on my way to the pub. And the, the, uh, the guy actually believed him because it's Barnes, and he's incredibly charming. That's a fun one. Missed that guy. And then we had a smart meter is another example of too quick to market, um, throwing caution to the wind. We, we saw these devices being bolted to the side of people's homes. Um, being talked about, you know, uh, rollouts of a uh, 40, 34 million uh, smart meters will be rolled out across the UK in the next, you know, 10 to f you know, t five to 10 years, and we're like, well, who's actually audited those things? Anybody? And so we took it upon ourselves to look at them, and uh, lo and behold, we figured out it had a, an attack service, attack service that's actually warmable, so you could get remote code execution on one meter, and it would propagate to the next, and the next, and the next, and then you could possibly create a, uh, a, a load shed that would cause either black or brown out throughout the power grid. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody in, uh, 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 not to name any countries, but a foreign country uh, playing Tetris with my, my city or my country. And I've talked to some hackers, and that's their, their number one goal is to play Tetris from space. Uh, so I don't know. And then, uh, you know, you've seen the Italian job uh, where they actually took over the city lights, uh, street lights, and were able to compromise and say, okay, all streets going uh, northbound on Avenue, uh, Fifth Avenue go green and everything else go uh, red. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that as well, smart meters, or uh, traffic, smart cities enabling traffic meters to be connected to the internet. Uh, so you can kind of see there's this reoccurring theme that technology, as we know, that's early and it's a, uh, development gets released into the public and kind of needs to have an extra set of eyes on it and uh, today's kind of like that challenge goes out to you guys if you see something come out uh, fire up Ida Pro um, go grab some fuzz testing uh, frameworks and go nuts on it because it's it's really nobody else is doing it it's kind of just us um, we probably saw some of our research too we just hacked a robot so you know everybody's talking about we're gonna be replaced by robots I don't want to be attacked by a robot. I don't know about you. Okay, so more tech, more threat. Getting into the hardware bit of this presentation. Uh, and stop me anytime if I'm boring you or if you got any questions. Um, so I don't know if you remember in 2003 there was, a, uh, there was a backdoor put into the Linux kernel tree, or source tree. And that backdoor is really clever. It, uh, it basically, uh, as you can see down here at the very bottom of the slide, uh, it is doing a check. Uh, any kind of program that called the wait function uh, would go ahead and check some environment variables and then uh, uh, reassign uh, the user ID to root. And instead of this being a comparison operator, it was a git operator. So this would give any program that called wait for root access on the system. Uh, it's a one character difference. And I don't know about you, but if you looked at the Linux source tree, uh, it's huge, and to find stuff like this is uh, would be quite daunting. 
uh, the the, uh, the the trilogy of back doors here. So if this can happen in the software world, what makes it not possible to happen in the hardware world? Well, just uh, last year, the University of Michigan released a paper on uh, just that very subject, and they found out that if a uh, insider, basically, of a, a found chip foundry, uh, went ahead and added one more cell to the mask, and the mask is basically the blueprint for the chip, that they could go ahead and add this back door, and this back door would be just as subtle as that Linux back door uh, was. It's hard to detect. Um, it's a, one extra cell in a million gates, and basically the way it would work is that you would visit a web page or uh, God forbid you download that, that exe that somebody sent you uh, in email, and it would run some programs that would purposely uh, and passively charge that cell. And at a certain point, it would tip over and trigger a function within the chip that would put the chip into basically system mode or ring zero, letting anything on that chip now run as root. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's kind of creepy. Um, and I don't know anybody right now that their job is exclusively to check masks before it goes to production. I do know large software companies employ teams of former uh, intelligent community, like GCHQ, NSA types, of people to work in the private sector to do nothing but monitor their employee workforce for these kind of insiders, because there are quite a few, to be honest, of uh, people working for foreign go governments and technology companies that do nothing but insert backdoors or uh, copy code out or give information about newly discovered vulnerabilities that haven't been made public to offensive security teams. And when you think about, uh, say, for example, China always gets picked on, but I'll just use an example. If you think about these countries that have uh, gone ahead and, and, and allocated entire cities and communities uh, of apartment buildings to nothing but hackers. They go, you want a, you want a free place to uh, live? You want a computer? You want an internet connection? Go ahead and sit in that apartment. And as long as you are finding vulnerabilities and giving us, uh, uh, you know, remote access to new computers, like we'll just say five a week, you can go ahead and keep your apartment. And these are like thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Uh, team, the Tau team in, uh, in the NSA is supposed to be roughly about 1,200 teams, six people deep. And that, that's a lot of, that's a lot of eyes and ears on, on nothing but offensive security in our world. So we definitely have our work cut out for us. Go back to the abacus. Okay, any questions so far? No. Okay, so when you're uh, helping your clients or your, your company kind of consider uh, these threats, you might want to ask yourself, uh, you know, who's in your supply chain? Where did that computer come from? Uh, what third parties are developing your code? What's their internal policy for vetting people working on that code? If it's sensitive code, you know, obviously you want to maybe go back and watch the Citizen 4 documentary to understand exactly that this is not, this is not the uh, topic of the tinfoil hat crowd anymore. This is real stuff. Your, your adversary is well-funded and they're determined and they've been at it for a long time. Um, and it's up to us to make sure that we're doing our part and being professional and ensuring that we've done everything we possibly can to make it hard for the adversary to uh, compromise whatever we're up to. I don't want my car being driven off the road because I said the wrong thing at a conference, for example. And recently, we've made the NSA's 18th most interesting companies to go after, and that was leaked in the Snowden uh, documents. And I don't know, 18, I'm like, come on, can we done like five or something? But no, we're 18, that's just, too, that's too much anyways. So I always terrorize our, our uh, IT guys. I'm always like, are you sure you did that right? You know, you know where we're at on the list, right? Don't sleep. It's great, it's good fun. Uh, okay, and uh, talking about supply chain security, um, so I don't, in 2005, there was uh, uh, the five eyes, which are a few, uh, the big, you know, Canada, Australia, the UK, the US, and, and a couple others that actually sent a memo around internally that, that said no more purchase of Lenovo uh, products. Basically, one of the agencies had found that there were confirmed hardware and firmware backdoors in the product itself, and that these, these would not be deployed anywhere in the classified networks of these, uh, of these uh, entities. 
Uh, that's pretty scary stuff, because I don't know about you, but I never got that memo um, until much later. It's way too late. So you can see the supply chain and chip security and firmware security are a real thing. And right now, I don't really believe we have a wholesale set of tools that allows us to, uh, you know, talk to a chip and go, where have you been lately? You know, can we go ahead and scan the, the registers and whatnot to make sure that it's not been uh, compromised by a foreign entity? Sure, we, we have IDS, we have ASLR, we have DEP. We have all these tools for the software world, but not necessarily for the chip world. Um, it's gotten so bad that post known re revelations at Cisco, if you uh, were, say, a large tech company, you know, fill in the blank, we'll say uh, uh, Amazon, and you order a bunch of Cisco kit, uh, Cisco's now made it a point of shipping the hardware that you've ordered for your large publicly traded organization to a, a dead drop zone, a place that doesn't have anything to do with your corporate headquarters, and then you come pick that up. So you'll find all your server equipment, your router switches sitting in an empty office building somewhere that you have to send some guy with a truck and a cart to go pick up, put into there into the vehicle and take to your data center because the NSA basically picks up where products are being shipped and the minute it goes into a watch list and says, oh, look, that's going off to uh, Apple's uh, data center, that's going off to this data center, um, they, uh, they go ahead and intercept it, uh, open the boxes, put their own firmware on, uh, and then actually they have the OEM tape, tape it back with the, the Dell tape or the, or the Cisco tape. You can't even tell it's been opened. And they can do this within like, I think their turnaround hours, like uh, turnaround times three hours. That's crazy. So there's a reason to be concerned. And again, this is all, uh, this isn't conspiracy theory. It's all documented and you can take a look at it. And I think that's why BT, which is a big telecom provider in the UK, went ahead and they bought Huawei Kit, and they did nothing for the first uh, three years, um, I think maybe six, uh, uh, reverse engineer it, pen test it, reverse engineer it some more, because I think they just felt that everything was compromised anyway, so might as well buy the kit that's cheaper and uh, put the security investment on it. So the money they saved, they just bought, they just hired a bunch of security uh teams to do nothing pen test the hell out of, hell out of it and then uh, rolled it out across the entire country so they did a forklift upgrade on their telecoms uh, interesting uh, new approaches to life I guess uh, post node so we've talked a little bit about uh, uh, what the problem is the way I see it um, and uh, I guess the idea too is understand the attackers and their and their wherewithal so this classic uh, threat taxonomy you got the outsider uh, person looking in uh, could be a hobbyist or somebody a little bit more clever, uh, knowledgeable insider, uh, think maybe like a Snowden-like person, but with hardware skills, and then class three organizations. Uh, that's the one I'm, I'm a little bit uh, keeps me up at night. Um, goodness knows their agenda. I mean, we have foreign governments right now interfering with elections, which I think is super funny because the first time I heard that, I'm like, that's bad, and then I found out that that's been going on for a long, long time. So it's not just Russia invented the ability to influence uh, elections remotely. All right, case studies. So on this, on the next couple of slides, uh, instead of looking for the geopolitical references about why things are bad, this is more uh, profiteering. So a lot of this chip hacking uh, uh, industry became more public uh, when it came into the satellite TV, pay TV. Uh, Carson Knoll knows a lot about uh, basically, there was a, a, a company called News Corp that spun up another company called NDS, and NDS's job was to ensure that uh, its satellite TV broadcasts were secure and that its competitors uh, were not. And this is, it's, it's pretty amazing. If you have a, a little bit of time, I'd recommend reading a book called Murdoch's Pirates because you can actually see how uh, people that use technology uh, to actively undermine the interests of their competitors to the point of they actually put the company called On Digital out of business in 2002 because of the uh, uh, what they were up to. So every time On Digital would release a patch for their uh, their, their smart card, basically, uh, NDS would pay a group of hackers to hack it again and release the exploit on a website called uh, Thoic, which is uh, the house of ill compute that NDS also funded, which was Murdoch's money. So it's kind of like, um, say, uh, Apple is giving, uh, not a bad example, it's, it's basically like you're, you're, 
you're pre pretending you're normal and you're an ups, uh, upstanding citizen, but in the meantime, you're completely stealing the engine out of your competitor's car. You know, they get up in the morning and go to work, and they can't get there because the, the car engine's gone. So it's a little underhanded. And eventually, NDS was sued along with News Corp, and um, they settled out of court, of course. Uh, and uh, I think NDS ended up uh, paying $1,500 total to Echo Star, uh, one of the companies that was suing. And then uh, Canal Plus, uh, basically they worked a deal where uh, 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 News Corp uh, ended up buying one of their failing companies in Italy. But this, the gravity of this situation is that the, the hardware security actually caused a large company, a company that was first to market in the satellite TV space, to go out of business. And I think that's something to really think about. It wasn't, could have been mismanagement, but it certainly doesn't help when your subscriber base doesn't pay. Oh, our favorite here, Nintendo versus Atari. So Atari kind of crashed and burned in the 80s. Um, they had a, they had one bad game. They had a few bad games. They didn't uh, control the quality of the games that were going on to the console, so people kind of got a little uh, uh, disenfranchised with the product. So they had a hard time. Um, then they saw Nintendo enter the uh, market space, and Nintendo did a great job because they had this uh, chip, a kick, which is basically just a fancy word for DRM technology. It only allowed games that were approved by them to enter into their walled garden, basically. Well, Atari wanted in on that action, and so instead of reverse engineering the chip like NDS did, um, they went ahead and spoke to the patent office uh, because they were uh, curious about whether or not there was pat patent infringements or whatnot. And the patent office inadvertently, um, or maybe, I'm not sure, maybe they did it on purpose, they gave Atari the actual uh, methodology and maybe even code to the way that uh, Nintendo had implemented this kick chip. Now keep in mind the kick chip had withstood 20 years of reverse engineering and nobody could get around it. Other than sh uh, they, they actually uh, some people did get around it, and the way they got around it is they stunned it. I think it was 27 volts or something. That stunned the chip on boot, knock it offline while they're uh, third-party game loading. That's really interesting. But um, uh, anyways, long story short, uh, they they created the chip so they could enter into this market. So another example of people hacking at the hardware layer to uh, enable a uh, profit. Not sure why they didn't just license Nintendo stuff, but uh, they got sued as well. Um, U.S. Patent Office Super wasn't happy with what they did, obviously, and uh, the rest is history. So you can kind of see we've got some spooky cloak and dagger stuff, and then we have the classic profiteering at play as far as the threat actors in the hardware space. So quick overview and state of uh, embedded security. Um, so we figured out software security, we, you know, a bit, we're much better than we used to be. You know, uh, LF1's paper from uh, 2006 isn't as applicable as it once was. But now here comes IoT, and IoT is just a nice fancy word for embedded systems with either embedded Linux or RTOS systems, QNX, et cetera. And a lot of those systems don't have uh, the checks that the, uh, their larger counterparts do. So now your buffer overflows start to work again, Oops. Uh, which is exciting for people who have gotten bored lately. Uh, and the sheer size of IoT is impressive. So in 2020, they, uh, they quote that 60 billion uh, IoT devices will be on the internet functioning. And we just saw a, uh, a botnet able uh, to generate 620 gigabits of traffic in one situation against Brian Krebs. Does anybody know why Brian Krebs keeps getting attacked? I know. But... Uh, <laughs> He's got to feel important, right? You're like, wow, I'm really loved. Uh, the last attack, somebody sent him a magazine with heroin taped to the back of it and then called the police on him to try to get him busted for heroin. That's insane. And he's done, he's done, he's just reporting on the hacking community. Uh, anyways, fine, choose your friends. Um, so, so that's a big deal. Everybody, before IoT came out, everybody was warning against this. Like, you know, you guys can go do your IoT. You can make your refrigerator IP connected. You can put a, a stack on your coffee maker and your kid's Barbie doll, but it will come back to burn you. And the security community was like, like we always do, pitchforks and the, you know, swords. Like, hey, don't forget to do security. Well, they didn't do it. 
And uh, here we are with this colossal mess on our hands. So again, we're back to it's up to us to stem the tide and get the, the re research and get the guidance and help people down the Socratic path of doing security right the first time. To release a, release a product from a software perspective into the market that hasn't been security tested, each vulnerability on average costs the company about $2 million to respond to through instant handling, patch updates, uh, PR, etc. So when you're talking to these hardware people, maybe just let them know that we're trying to save you money too. Um, so you saw some of the smart cities things uh, we've done, hacked, we've hacked the uh, traffic system. They, they want to basically make uh, cities completely connected, and that means a lot of IoT. So if your city is thinking about this soon uh, to roll it out, or if they have already, say you live in Denver, Colorado, where the mayor can actually pull up a smartphone app and dim the lights of the city from her phone, uh, I would suggest trying to talk to them sooner rather than later. We're not, we're not going to run out of work anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> so now we're going to get into stuff maybe you're all, just so we all know, I am not a hardware hacker. I'm not a FIB engineer. I'm none of this. If you want those conversations, find somebody else. I'm just here to present a story. All right, so here's our lab. We have two hardware labs. One's uh, in Seattle and the other one's in Madrid. Um, the reason that we built these labs, as you can kind of guess by now, is that there's an overwhelming need to do hardware security. Uh, in the Seattle lab, we have what we call a scanning electron microscope. We have uh, a FIB, focus ion beam laser, confocal equipment, uh, we have a full chemical room, uh, probing stations, and a uh, uh, garage specifically equipped for uh, automotive research. And then uh, the Madrid lab, a uh, uh, bit similar, but has a, a, a specific department uh, for embedded IoT systems and to do uh, tamper resistance uh, uh, testing. So here's some, uh, one of the things that, you know, from the, the world is the root of trust, these, these microchips uh, that are in, end up being TPMs, they end up authenticating your handset to the network, uh, making sure that you've paid your satellite bill, DRM, identify you to uh, borders, uh, make sure your print cartridge is actually legit, and your auto parts were bought from the auto part manufacturer that wanted you to uh, only buy their OEM parts. Um, so. The interesting thing that I've learned uh, over the past years is that, again, just like Atari, uh, a lot of the companies are like they want to offer a third-party print cartridge, so they'll go off to one of these black hat. I don't know if you'd call it black or gray. It's kind of up in the air about what the the legality of all is. But they'll go off to one of these organizations uh, and they'll give them the product and they say, "Look, I want to be able to offer printer cartridges, printer cartridges for that." printer and then the, the the team will go ahead and use their fib their sim to break down the chip and understand how it works reverse the protocol and then hand it back to the client who then goes off and makes a third-party product so there's a lot of that in this hardware hacking industry um, not so much on the offensive side it's more on the i want to offer product into a closed wall uh, uh, community so here's a basic uh, anatomy of a chip uh, nothing new here, processor, memory, EEPROM, uh, interesting, uh, there's a lot of, th this goes really deep and, and we're not going to get into all of it today, but uh, some cute things they've done is they put fuses on the board to ensure that if somebody's trying to reverse engineer it, they can't just hook onto the JTAG, which is basically a debug port, and uh, pull off the firmware too easy. Uh, in the old days they did. Um, but uh, if you mill the chip down and, and polish it and, and then uh, scan it, this is what you end up having to look at. So from the attacker's toolbox, like the software world, you know, you've got the, the classic buffer overflow, SQL injection, uh, cross-site scripting, off by one errors, the same kind of uh, attacks, but for hardware within the hardware world. And, you know, this requires a EE background sometimes. Sometimes it just requires a... a insatiable curiosity for hardware like the guy Oliver um, who did a lot of the chip hacking back in the satellite days uh, he just loved this stuff so he just kept hacking on it hacking on it hacking on it and he was the chief pirate for a long time to the point where he was getting paid a quarter million pounds just to release the next break on on a uh, digital system he'd fly into London meet with a bunch of uh, basically like uh, 
uh, street vendors that wanted to sell uh, pay TV cards, and he would say, look, it's a quarter million, and uh, you guys can go ahead and take the blueprint and run with it. Uh, so he didn't have really a formal education in it, but he learned how to do it. He made a lot of money. Now he's living in Uruguay. Uh, so we'll get into component sniffing later. So much like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with white box or black box analysis in the software review world, but it's the same as, you can kind of liken the two. Black box uh, testing would be similar to the non-invasive chip, chip hacking. Uh, where you're not actually destroying the chip itself, you're you're interfacing it, interfacing with it either via side channel attacks or over a bus or a JTAG port or a serial header that's been uh, removed. Uh, but you're, the the board should still be functioning when you're done with it. Uh, so non-invasive hacking, and then invasive hacking is when you're actually putting a chip into sulfuric acid, etc., and the chip's never going to come back to life. But that would be kind of like the white box review where you're actually looking at the chip, figuring out how the designers uh, laid it out and where to attack it specifically. So there's a glitching attack both on the power and the clock. And basically, uh, imagine uh, just trying to abuse the functionality of the chip. So it does things like spit out its firmware or spit out its keys because you over revved or you under revved the clock. Um, you made it go plus six volts and then down down to like negative something and it's just like what are you doing I don't understand and it just throws up on you um, kind of like fuzz testing in a way uh, and there's a bunch of uh, power analysis they've done amazing things uh, that we'll get into a bit later on power analysis and timing attacks to where they can actually monitor the power supply of the device and figure out what key it generated size etc I think that's just mind-boggling way above my pay grade uh, stuff, but if you're interested in this, uh, the the, the uh, it's fascinating to read. So here's a JTAG uh, interface, uh, good for again removing firmware to reverse engineer and find vulnerabilities, uh, or key extraction, or just maybe reflashing the board with your own stuff. You remember like the Open WRT uh, product uh, or software project project. Oftentimes, if it's a board that they're not don't have a lot of time on, you end up having to flash the board with over the JTAG port with their uh, firmware. And you'll be happy to know like silly things like default passwords uh, exist on these on these uh, embedded devices, static passwords that never change, burned into EEPROM. Uh, things that you know you, you thought were dead and gone from years ago have now resurfaced and uh, are alive and well and they're really rookie security mistakes. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of a, a anti or of a blown JTAG fuse. As you can see on the top right hand corner, uh, there's you can see the, the circuit's not connected. That's what it looks like when a fuse is blown. And then on the bottom, bottom right, it's connected. So with the FIB, uh, one of the attacks you can do is you can load this up, this chip up in the FIB, and you can re-establish that circuit with the FIB edit. So now the JTAG's reattached and you can dump the firmware or whatever you're after. Um, the other thing you can do is, uh, you know, say that the uh, embedded device has a bootloader. Sometimes the bootloader is not authenticated, so you can go ahead and feed it bits, whatever you want, to get it to boot it. Um, not necessarily the secure by, desi by design, by default uh, method. And now moving on to more uh, interesting things. Uh, the embedded world's good. It's fun stuff. You can get into that hacking. Uh, probably, you know, if you want to get the equipment, you're going to run anywhere from maybe a thousand to five thousand dollars for a rig, uh, and you can uh, you can take a lot of the classes that they have here, or you can talk to Dimitri uh, about taking amazing hardware hacking classes, and I recommend you do that. I might you might see me in there. Who knows? <laughs> uh, invasive chip hacking. Uh, this is where we're actually decapping the chip and putting it into the SIM and the FIB and the uh, reactive IMB matcher, depending on what we need. Uh, first step of it is to open the package, which means using either a mechanical or a chemical process. We'll have a video of that a bit later. Um, then we uh, examine the, the chip under a microscope to try to understand uh, how it works. And then we, uh, we spend more time actually trying to conduct the uh, attack offline, basically once we've imaged the chip and understand uh, where, where all its components are and how to go about attacking it. And then we come back to the FIB to do those edits. Stop me if, I'm, uh, if you've got any questions at all. All right, so on the right hand 
side, you can see that was that's actually a fib edit there. Uh, they've milled it down a bit, top right corner. So you're you're hacking at the the nanometer uh, level, which is pretty amazing. And for me, I see it as rocket science. And when the guys are working away in the lab, I'm just like, I'm not worthy. Pretty amazing stuff. It's a kid in the candy factory when you see it all done. Um, and to kind of, it's really cool too as software engineers to understand that our software, you know. It gets compiled down to, in essence, just a stream of ones and zeros that then we trust to run on this hardware. And then you see somebody breaking the security module of that of that chip that you relied on to generate AES-256 keys. You're like, wait, that's, no, did you just, uh, you got the AES key that I've been storing there for years. That's not good. Uh, silly things like that. Things that, you know, I personally as a software dev never, never thought were possible. Uh, there was one a, a case study where there was a crypto processor um, that was being used in the IBM uh, 8507 or something like that, and they would have to replace them every so often. And these devices were then thrown into uh, into a, a garbage can. This guy paid the uh, cleaner to, next time you're, you're taking out the trash, please give me that crypto processor. And so the guy did, and what he was able to do, because uh, in the old days, he was able to do a memory uh, uh, remnants attack. The key, the master key for the entire banky, bank, was burned into the memory, and he was able to dump that and get the key and decrypt all the bank's transactions. Uh, so it's uh, fun stuff. That, the crypto processors are amazing. They're they're in ways they have a thermite um, uh, loads on them. So if you open the casing, it has a shape blast that blows apart the chip on the later ones. I don't know about you, but that's like hacker folklore, you know, where somebody grabs your hard disk and just poof, obliterates. We all want that, right? Well, they've got it in the banking industry. Okay, so uh, decap the chip. Uh, you can do rear side programming attacks, which uh, means that you just flip the board over or the chip over, and you can use UV to go through the layers, and you're not actually having to um, uh, mill at the chip, et cetera. For some reason, you can, it's physics, I don't get it, but the, uh, you can look through the chip four layers or seven layers and get the whole read out of the board. Okay, here's the... Uh, our uh, reactive ion etcher, that thing has a, uh, we have this really cool uh, video of it, but I wasn't able to get it because the uh, network was bad. Okay, so here's our chemical bath. I've uh, got a video coming up. Basically, uh, the chip is in a package, and to get at the chip, you need to remove the package uh, so you can get at the actual uh, uh, device itself and start the uh, polishing process. So let's see if this works. I sped it up so you guys don't have to stare at it for too long. It usually takes a bit more time than this, and you definitely don't want to have uh, This isn't a fume hood, so when the process is doing its thing, you're not uh, inhaling toxic gases. And you should have seen the insurance company when we asked for the insurance policy for this. It was uh, a funny conversation. They're like, now what do you guys do again? It's like a scene out of Breaking Bad or whatnot. So that's decapping a chip for later processing in the FIB and, uh, and, and moving over to the uh, probing station. I'm, I'm sure in five to ten years, if you're a security shop, you're going to have to have all of this kit with the embedded uh, systems going the way they are and security being pushed farther and farther down in the, uh, uh, into the chip. Uh, for example, Intel introduced another ring to the x86 architecture, a negative one for, uh, um, for their uh, trusted uh, computing platform. I don't know. Do you guys know you have an entire software suite running in ring negative one? They haven't made an edit to the uh, Intel uh, chip architecture in decades. This is the first time. Uh, so now we examine the chip. Oftentimes you're looking for uh, repeating patterns, uh, looking for the core, looking for uh, EEPROM. Sometimes if they didn't encrypt the EEPROM, you can, you can actually visually read it out with a microscope, the ones and zeros. Most EEPROMs are encrypted. Uh, Communication paths in between the devices. Uh, they used to be on unencrypted buses, but now they encrypt the bus because of the FIB edits, etc. Reading, being able to actively read data off off the bus of the chip when it's running, uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, but as we move on in time, it's not we're not hacking like the old days of pay TV. The uh, we've gone from 134 nanometer traces down to uh, much smaller in the 90 range, and uh, the uh, the chips are laid out not necessarily by hand anymore. They're laid out by machines, which makes them very hard to 
uh, follow and understand because uh, it's a very complex problem and a lot of the labs like us are working on that today to figure out how to uh, remedy that problem. Uh, it's going to take a lot of software and five minutes, yeah I got it, uh, a lot of software and hard work. So i uh, got about five minutes here. I'm going to try to speed through this. This work here was done by uh, Dimitri, uh, who's an amazing guy out of Berlin. If you get a chance to talk to him, uh, tell him I said hi. Uh, he uh, loves chip hacking. So here we go. Uh, he's done some uh, uh, photo, uh, uh, infrared photo work on chips. And this is actually uh, what a chip looks like under infrared light uh, to, uh, with, a, with a microscope uh, doing its thing. I think, I think that's pretty cool. He's loading data onto a bus, analyzing it, and then eventually he'll be using this to extract an AES key. So when you see the, uh, the FIPS 140 rating or a common criteria rating, don't always believe it unless you have uh, smart people uh, like Dimitri uh, giving a whack at it or us. And you can see uh, here's the act activity on the chip. It's uh, like hacking the matrix, but in uh, the physical world, uh, that bright spot on the right hand side, that is actually the AES engine. So you look at these, you talked about the, the million, the billion gate problem. Uh, may, maybe using this technique, you can kind of isolate the area of the chip that you want to go look at because you can see almost in a sense it's heat signature or the uh, to uh, go explore. Good stuff. Okay, the probing station, the FIB. Uh, the FIB's really used to do edits and, and set up pads, uh, basically going through metal layers one or, uh, or through seven, depending what you're after. Usually you're after a data bus or a clock line. Um, you mill a hole, and in this case, they have a security mesh. Uh, this this uh, image was taken uh, by Oliver, the master hacker from, uh, from the pay TV days. And as you can see where that cross is, is where he's done a FIB edit. He's milled between the security mesh. And the security mesh, basically, if you breach the security mesh, the chip is supposed to zero its keys and destroy itself. But if you have a fib, you can go in between those very small uh, uh, traces and make a drill hole down to the uh, lower data bus and start to extract data. And that's what he did in the situation. Uh, that's what you would use a fib for. And on the, uh, on the left hand side, you can see how the chip has a bit of a, a copper that's been exposed. And that's where the, 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 uh, the foundry had made a mistake or the designer of the chip and didn't actually extend the uh, security mesh over the entire chip. So you can see that they're, uh, they exposed the, uh, the power line. So now you can do some glitching attacks. So nothing is perfect, just like in software. Um, okay. Two minutes, guys. You're almost done. Thanks for bearing with me. All right, here's some, a nice video for you of us zooming around a chip. Uh, the difference with this video is that we, we've been able to do some pretty high resolution uh, imagery, and it's uh, it's down to uh, we can go down to 14 nanometers. And when we first started the hardware lab, we we're doing 134 uh, nanometers. So we've come quite a long ways. And go. So the first stop on the uh, tour is flash memory. They're zooming in. This looks much better on my screen, by the way. And then uh, now we've looked looking at some fl fake uh, flakes of glass that ended up on the chip. There you can barely see it, but there's kind of like a shiny dot like the North Star. That's fill metal. And then uh, the chip manufacturer here has gone ahead and left us a, a, a nice note that says uh, reproduction of this area is uh, prohibited. So that will keep us out of it for sure. Here we get to the, uh, the billion gate problem. Once it zooms in, you can start to see the complexity and how th these aren't hand laid out anymore. They're laid out by a computer and it's hard to tell which way is up. And some of these circuits, they don't, they're not even real circuits. They just put them in there to uh, uh, confuse you, kind of like a paper tiger. And then uh, the next stop is the uh, power conduit of the chip. Exciting. All right, so you can see this is a uh, hacking in the 21st and a half century. And uh, we'll move on from there. So designing for security, uh, some of the things you want to keep in mind is if you can, if you're a chip designer, you know, don't don't make your uh, component, don't label your components, uh, get rid of your exposed debugging inter interfaces, uh, you know, uh, encrypt your memory, uh, definitely have third party look at your tamper uh, mechanisms, 
Don't leave a serial uh, console on your board and just like shave off the header and hope nobody knows it's the RS-232 port. Uh, don't put back doors in your products. Like some people like to put back doors in their embedded systems for maintenance reasons. Don't do that because we will find them. You dump the firmware, you will find it. You just run strings against the firmware and you find, oh wow, look, there's the password, username and pass. And then they use that same password across all devices, which now you've got 14 million, 14 million of them out in the, in the real world and patching hardware is not as easy as patching software and costs tons of money. So best practices, uh, you know, I think best practices is uh, uh, go to lots of training for this, and hopefully uh, the hardware world will get in front of the right people to uh, get them encouraged to talk to us, because right now it's kind of like the old days of, uh, of security where people said the hackers weren't real, and that's the, the, the folklore of, like, unicorns and whatnot. Let me tell you, back at, uh, 19 years ago, uh, everybody thought hackers weren't real, and now look at them. You look at the TV, and we're, like, front line center. Okay, so that's it, guys. You made it. Any questions? I'm a little jet lag, so hopefully I didn't kill you with uh, boredom. Questions? Anyone? Yeah. yeah. So thank you. I agree completely with your your statements of the early uh, part of the presentation about securing supply chain and trusting your your suppliers. Uh, but when you work for an international company and uh, producing products for parts all over the world, and you have uh, large organizations in all in all countries all over the world. How do you suggest dealing with that in a um, acceptable way when when a lot of those people are saying produce here because it's cheaper, when that same country is one that's not really well trusted by the rest of the world? Any any ideas on that? You understand the problem, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I get it. That, that I think the most clever one I've seen so far is what BT did, and they said, they said okay, so instead of paying you know hundred dollars for that kit uh, from like Cisco, we're going to pay ten from Huawei, and we're going to take that ninety dollars, and we're going to invest it back into security audits for that supply chain. And uh, to their credit, uh, they found lots of vulnerabilities in those products, and they were uh, when they handed them back over to Huawei, they were very quick to fix them. So I don't know, that could be one strategy. Um, but you're right, uh, when you're in a large international organization, what do you do? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think there's an easy one for that. Yeah, that's a hard one. I, I wish there was an easy answer. Abacus, move back to the abacus. Anything else? When we select a software vendor, we ask for different set of controls and other things which we, they can demonstrate to get the product uh, as a self-assurance. But for the screening or the partner screening of the hardware, what type of, uh, is there any specific uh, standards or other thing came up right now to give them a comfort to the prospective customer that this, because you talked about Lenovo, because once fail it has to get out from the system. So, is there any set of uh, standards which partner before when the partner screening is on for hardware, they can give the satisfaction to the customer that their security is up to the level and will not be compromised along with the uh, bundle with the software layer? Um, so uh, let me repeat the question. So you're asking uh, what kind of assurances can uh, a company give to their clients about what kind of due diligence they've done uh, on their part to ensure yes. that they, their their supply chain hasn't been breached. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, to give the satisfaction that the hardware security is okay and will not be fudged around the way you described it. Mm -hmm. Is there any standards and other thing or well, thing which gives at the moment at present in the uh, ecosystem. It, de it depends on what country you live in, I guess, yeah. is one way, because, uh, you know, one person's superhero is another person's, you know, terrorist, right? But, like, say in the States, there's the uh, trusted uh, uh, the trusted uh, foundry program set up by the DOD, and that foundry, uh, that program is uh, chip makers that are only uh, basically complying with certain standards. They're oftentimes domestic, so if you're developing some 
uh, a weapon of uh, a actual weapon and it requires chips you as a as a company are required to use this trusted foundry program uh, according to the US government and so in that sense you're giving a, a some kind of attestation to your in client that look we've only used pre-approved chips in our product and that's the part that we've done there's also FIPS 140 compliance uh, there's common criteria uh, there's a lot of debate about whether or not those programs are good or not, but I guess it's at least a step in the right direction. Um, yeah, and I think also partnering with uh, your local, uh, um, uh, you know, whoever works in your foreign intelligence office, and et cetera, and ask them like, "Hey, what do you think about this vendor?" Because they seem to know a lot more than we think they do. Uh, they often, yeah, they got really good intel. Scary things, anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was inferring that maybe there would be a similar program in the country that you live in. So if you were, live in, uh, uh, say, the UAE, that they have a similar trusted foundry program. Um, but yeah, but you're right, they do have a, you're certainly not going to get a mill grade ship shipped to you in uh, Iran. That's not going to happen. But I've got to imagine there's something out there. Yeah. Next question? Sure. Uh, so you were uh, talking about uh, about lack of trust in supply chain. Now there's some countries like in the U.S. they've gone after Huawei and ZTE and uh, tried to have sanctions against them against using Huawei and ZTE products in uh, the telecom sector in the U.S. Similarly. Uh, uh, there are similar rules in, in Australia as well. In India, we've requested Huawei to uh, to share source code, uh, and there's a lab in IISC uh, in Bangalore that where they've been studying source code. Except, I'm not sure targeting country, you know, specific companies and specific countries makes any sense because these, uh, while some of the uh, uh, you know vulnerabilities are are deliberate. Others are not. That's true. So, for and and for military grade stuff, you can have a trusted foundry, you know, system. What do you do for something like you know the networking infrastructure that your telecom companies use? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you ensure that that isn't vulnerable? What kind of programs can a government, uh, you know, roll out to try to improve the uh, security in that area? It's a good question. That's why you're all here. <laughs> You won't be replaced by robots. Let's put it that way. So it's it's great questions. It's a difficult problem to solve, and that's uh, you know the slide. Obviously, hardware security is not new, but it's 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 these are the questions that we we need to all be contemplating and figuring out programs and approaches to help uh, secure the rest of the the the, supply, uh, the the system. You know, we can't just be writing secure code that's been uh, sitting on chips that's been backdoored at the factory. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Joshua. You. Thanks a lot.